Welcome, everyone. Please uh, find yourself comfortable, whatever position you're in. And I invite you to close your eyes. And a lot of activities in the monastery, we begin with uh, three sounds of the bell. And the three sounds of the bell help us uh, form a, a habit of checking in. And there's two things we check into, is our body and our feelings. So as we breathe, uh, we follow our breath. We follow our eyes, our eyes are closed, but then we have another eye, an eye of awareness. So we follow the breath with our awareness. So that's a different kind of eye, different looking. With our eyes closed, we are not distracted by the external condition. But now we come, return to uh, inner condition, being aware of our breath. I like everyone to really take a really deep breath, all the way down to your belly, then let it go. Wonderful. In, out. And we do that again with our nostril. And let's see if you can do it without making sounds, but also as uh, deep. Okay, in, out slowly. So with the breath being with the breath awareness, we slowly become aware of our body, our shoulders, our neck, our chin. Try to move it around to see if you're holding your jaw, your cheek. And with each out breath, you let go of your shoulder a little bit more. Allow the weight of the earth to pull it down. Check in with your head. Is it sloping forward? Is it too tight in the back? You don't need to open your eyes. Just use your internal awareness. With each out breath, relax your body. Relax your cheek, your mouth, your tongue, your forehead. So you check in on your body anywhere that you're holding tightly, your fingers, your fist. Yes, with that each out breath you let go. In out. And check in with your feelings. Yeah. Look inward. How are you? You ask yourself, am I feeling agitated, restless, expecting? Do I feel calm, at ease, present? With our eyes closed, we check out our feelings, our state of mind. How are we? You feel sad, you feel happy, you feel tingling, bubbly, you feel solid, you feel light. So check in with each three sounds of the bell. Use your breath to examine yourself, your body and your mind. Each out breath letting go relaxing, and letting go of those feelings and just being present with the breath. And allow the sound of the bell to guide us go deeper and more present, increasing our relaxation, our ease, increasing our presence. In Listen, listen. Breathing out. 
this wonderful sound brings me back to my true home. How to maintain this uh, state throughout uh, our time together this morning. Once in a while, come back to your breath and stop listening and just follow your breath, okay? Dear beloved Thai, dear, um, dear friends, dear spiritual family, welcome to our, uh, our first day of uh, my day of mindfulness to start the new season. Some of you, uh, we've been closed for a very long time, I think. Uh, how many of you are waiting for, for us to open? Yeah? Okay. Uh, before we close for the U.S. tour, many lay friends try to come up with excuse to come up to Deer Park. Uh, I, have, I can help you with this. I can bring you donation. I have a... Uh, what was she? Oh, she had a, a lot of tea she wanted to donate. And I was like, no, we can't. <laughs> she, you can tell she just wants to come up and hang out up here. Um, so it's a great happiness uh, for us and for, uh, yeah, for everyone to, to, to come together. Um, we just had a U.S. tour where the monks and nuns travel to Blue Cliff uh, from all three centers and then to travel to uh, Magnolia Grove in Miss, uh, Mississippi, Batesville. And then uh, they ended up here in Deer Park and we had mm, three retreats. We had a uh, science retreat looking at public health and we had a retreat for Vietnamese speaking community. And then we ended up with an upper cut retreat a uh, monastic retreat. Mm, it's quite a knockout. <laughs> I wish you guys uh, could see that retreat. You think, you, what do you think we do in a monastic retreat? Yeah? More meditation? Intense sutra study? Secret practices? It's like, what do you guys do in monastic retreat? Lay friends try to sneak in to, uh, to see what we do. And uh, I wish you could see what we do, <laughs> but it would be quite embarrassing because we, we hardly practice, we, we just play. <laughs> and we build a sense of community. It's kind of like, you know, companies that go, uh, what do you call it, you know, team building kind of thing. So it's very focused on that, to understand each other and to listen and to play a lot. Because as you know, uh, an international community of 140, 50 people is quite a, uh, it's quite a corporation, huh? the Buddha's enterprise, I would say. And so that retreat brought a, I was uh, actually to confess, I was quite uh, not very, not fully supportive of such an investment of airplane 
flights and resources and all the planning just for a few retreats and traveling everywhere. Uh, but I think after the two retreats and especially the monastic treat, retreat, I saw how uh, important it is for our, uh, our monastic life, our culture, because it's, it's tough to respond to the needs of the society and our modern times. And a lot of monastics, uh, we do get burnt out. We also uh, feel, uh, yeah, we also need to renew our aspiration over and over again. And coming together and witnessing uh, how big our community is. I, yeah, I had a moment of uh, a kind of reviving um, Thay's intention what he was trying to do with the monastic to renew a kind of Buddhism, a kind of pra spiritual practice that is uh, accessible for people and not so much labeled uh, as a religious uh, institute, a religious, uh, what do they call it? religious organization, you know. And I used to be very uh, suspicious of institutions, especially religious ones, so I can't believe I'm in one. <laughs> the world does that, life does that to you. You think you have it all planned and then boom. I used to get upset at people who drive big, gigantic GM trucks, you know, the ones that kind of bully you in the rear view mirror. Now the brothers have one. <laughs> Not only one, but we have two. And I drove it the other day somewhere. Uh, it was quite, uh, I felt uh, bullyish. <laughs> but hopefully, you know, two bald monks in a bully car uh, can bring smiles to people. So these uh, things, um, uh, I think Thai was, uh, yeah, was quite uh, revolutionary in terms of uh, reviving our tradition for to to uh, make it accessible and easy understood by young people. Is throughout his whole life, uh, it was like that for him. He was attracted young people. And so for me, as a young person, that's just, uh, I came to Thai to find healing and then to um, re-examine my life. And I think that's what uh, I, I touched again being in the monastic retreat, seeing all my young siblings, is so many young brothers and sisters. Uh, it's, uh, I think I'm getting towards the bracket of being older, but <laughs> I played two volleyball games one day and then the next day. The third day, I, my legs were feeling it, and I almost got a little sick. And so it's, uh, it takes a bit to actually follow everything. Yeah. So, but I was quite nourished to see uh, the youthfulness and the joy and the connection. We had a lot, a lot of deep listening session as well. So that kind of revived again for me uh, what our places, uh, the monk, the monk and nun, has to do. Well, what our places in the world? What what are we doing? Why are people becoming monks and nuns? <laughs> it's crazy, huh? We had a re before the monastic retreat, or before all three retreats here, we had a uh, ordination ceremony for six new uh, monks and nuns. They don't know what they signed up for, but uh, they had their first monastic retreat right away as a monk or a nun. I'm sure they were like, wow, oh my God, what did I sign up for? <laughs> you know, that's... Uh, mm, yeah, we had... Uh, uh, a beautiful uh, ceremony here. Many of their family members came, and we got to hear them share too about uh, their uh, sibling, their child, their brother or sister becoming a monk or a nun. So it was a beautiful uh, kind of event before uh, now. Mm. So these are things that are kind of like the background of, uh, yeah, I felt inspired, uh, yeah, to. To, to look into our tradition. Mm. And yesterday, last night, mm, for some of you who uh, are not aware, uh, we 
we had a counting stick. We were the beginning of our rains retreat. It's the tradition that uh, Thai has brought back from the time of the Buddha, uh, 2,500 or 600 years ago. Uh, the rains retreat, um, you know, is a, a kind of tradition that uh, the monks and nuns had to uh, remain uh, stable, no moving around and traveling. So our tradition is quite uh, nomadic. The Buddha traveled a lot. And so there were seasons where it was difficult because of the weather, the monsoon, and as well as all the worms and bugs and the frogs. I don't, I don't know, in India they have frogs, but in, in Deer Park now, all these little baby frogs are coming out. So you have to really watch where you step. So you can see the, the need and the practicality of uh, coming and uh, staying put for three months and, uh, until the new spring comes. So the tradition comes from that. And last night we had a counting sticks. And I just share with you that there are actually a, quite a number of people coming to stay three months. Um, they read yesterday, and I, I, I took the piece of paper that they read from, how many uh, they counted. So each time, the counting stick, you get a stick to mark your place in the monastery in the three months. It's first for the kitchen. You know, they make sure that you have a space for food. <coughs> for food. So you can imagine the time the Buddha, 1,250 monks and, you know, and nuns. It's like, to organize the food is crazy. To organize where you go to the bathroom is crazy. So they had to like really, uh, so counting the stick is let the uh, food inspector, the, uh, we had a stick for the, the food inspector uh, um, spirit to kind of, and to big gratitude for all the donation of food, but as well as, uh, as a source, the practicality of it. So we had counting sticks and we had last night counted uh, 19 monks and 37 nuns. It's almost double the sisters. They're going to need more room soon. <laughs> and we had seven uh, uh, novice monks and three novice nuns. And we have 29 lay friends who, uh, I don't know, they know what they signed up for, but uh, they're here for three months. So just all together, we had 95 people here who have committed to stay put and we also define the boundaries of where we practice. So it's a kind of spiritual prison for you to... <laughs> yeah, you can't go out unless you ask. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's kind of like, are you serious? Yeah, and it's to... Uh, so, but you choose to come, so therefore there's a freedom involved. So when you do something deliberate, it's no longer a uh, restraint, but it's actually an opportunity. Anytime you restrict yourself from doing something, you're going to learn something. I don't know if you've ever experienced that. Like if you reduce yourself to eating one time a day, then all of a sudden you see that you crave for food like crazy, or that you see that you have so much time and how much time we spend on food, <laughs> you see? So anytime you restrain something, there's a benefit because you see something else. But most of the time we habitually go through things with unrestraint and we think that is freedom, but actually we are just a victim of our habits. And this, uh, if any of you have ever done, tried to like, do a New Year's resolution, it's tough because our habits are so strong. So anyway, that's what the, the, the symbol of defining a boundary means, is to create a zone for spiritual development. That means you see the rains, three months rains retreat is to come back and develop something else to take care of ourselves, to heal, to transform, to have insight, to see things differently. So that is the intention of the three months uh, rains retreat. And besides the practicality, the, the need for that it, from the time of the Buddha, 
in our time, we, uh, we see that it has a different purpose. Uh, you know, we expand it on its purpose. In the time of the Buddha, it was uh, uh, for, both for practical reason as well as for, uh, um, you know, imagine like if they, the monks travel with the Buddha like a lot, you know, going into different cities to beg and so on. It's quite uh, uh, stimulating. There's a lot of interaction and there's a kind of a very dispersed because you can't, you know, a thousand monks go to one little village. So there's a lot of... Uh, dispersion and so on. So the, the insight from the Buddha and many monastics after realized, okay, maybe we stay. And they were offered to stay at a, uh, at a park, uh, someone's garden, like one of the uh, uh, wealthy um, patron. And then from then, lay friends could bring food to the monastic and also receive teaching. So that's the origin of uh, our three months range retreat. A kind of need, practicality, as well as also helping the monks and nuns uh, train each other to re-examine our life and what it means to, to, uh, to be in society and what we have to offer. Um, for Thai, um, it was uh, um, a, a slow development. Uh, I think that he knew from working uh, during the wartime for peace that the uh, the activists, the peace color, the mm, how do you call the social uh, service people, the the students of Thai the, that included monks and nuns, and well as well as lay women, lay men, they uh, they helped Thai with many tasks to re- help re- rebuild the village and to uh, help the poor people and the villages that were devastated, he saw that they needed also replenishment. And so that idea came from there. And Thay uh, formed a uh, little center, Fragrant Palm Leaves, up in, uh, it's called Phu Boy. It's a little center. That was the beginning of our tradition of Thay's uh, vision to create a community, a center where people can come and replenish themselves to renew their, uh, their aspiration as well to examine and question what, what are we doing and why are we doing it. Mm. So this is something uh, still very re- relevant to our time. Um, I just want to mention, you know, Thay's uh, uh, mm, moving forward to call for peace. Uh, it continued all the way to now to forming a, a monastic community. And so that's where, for me, the question uh, I have in light of what is happening in the world mm, with a lot of uh, military action and a lot of violence uh, and uh, how do you call it? Um, inhuman acts of violence and how that can can manifest in a human being. What state of mind, what state of hate and anger that would move a person, an organization, a nation, a government, an individual to massacre, you know, women, families, children, you know, uh, face to face. And so that brings chills to my body, just to not only the victim, but also a human being who actually has that much hate and revenge and bitterness that they can cause something like that. So I try to uh, even... Uh, and it's scary for me to go into that mind. And it, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, was, it took me uh, many sessions of sitting with a candle and, and incense to really, you know, resist uh, uh, condemning and wanting to punish. It was quite, uh, I'm still very young in the practice. 
But uh, it's exactly uh, that kind of pain that actually it's very similar. Like when you're very, you're in so much pain and uh, constriction that is is the source of the explosion. That's what I realized. It's very similar. So when you suffer so much tremendously as an individual, as a group of people, that is actually it is the foundation for such. Uh, inhuman violence. And that's the scary part of us uh, as human beings, that we all have that capacity. Uh, it's a whole spectrum. You know, I try to reflect uh, when I was the most uh, extreme in my violence, in touching, you know, going near the, the, the border of what... Uh, would cause a human being to do that. And I remember being bullied in school, walking home and fearing being jumped, you know. And I did get jumped a few times. <laughs> and I remember walking, you know, from my bus stop back to my uh, home and, you know, being ready. And so we would pair up. I would pair up with my friend Frank, uh, Mexican background, and some Filipinos, and we would walk together. <laughs> I just share with you how I grew up in LA, right? And I, and I had no fear, you know. It was just like I was ready to do crazy stuff. You know? And luckily, there was no guns and you know swords back then. But I remember touching that as a young person, uh, actually being violent. Um, so that's a kind of uh, the fight part. What is it? Uh, fright, fight or flight or something? Yeah. And there's another part where uh, uh, when you're stuck, you know, have this anger inside, you don't know where to put it out to. And that was another extreme moment I had of uh, a little bit suicidal. Mm -hmm. I used to dry at night, late at night. My mom is here, she doesn't know this, but I used to drive in a circle in their parking lot, full speed, you know, full speed, like the, the wheels would be screeching and at any moment, you know, I could like let go and, you know, I don't know where it would go, but it was crazy. So I, I those are the two uh, extremes that I touch as uh, in this life, which is really nothing compared to what some of the conditions that uh, other people are, are in right now in the world. But I had to look at this and try to understand uh, the nature of violence, the nature of uh, inhuman acts uh, to, to kind of mm, protect me, to hold me from actually, uh, you know, uh, blaming. Is I still have a little, it's fully, you know, not... Uh, uh, at peace with it. I know it's still in me as a habit because of uh, so much, so many years of uh, uh, of environmental and uh, a kind of reaction. So this is uh, for me um, ties uh, how he saved my life. Uh, the point uh, I want to make is that type uh, uh, show me how to. Uh, uh, mm, take care of myself and to engage uh, in a spiritual path to bring meaning into my life. Mm. So we have the, the Buddha's uh, uh, path, right? You know, he was a young man, found, found a lot of dis-ease in himself and wanted to uh, find some peace for that finding peace, as well as finding another way to be in the world. Mm, there was a lot of violence during his time, too, and a lot of greed. The class of uh, rich people were also on the rise in the Buddhist time, uh, accumulation as well, and they had to protect it, so military also rise. So it's a very similar... Uh, so the time of the Buddha, we don't romanticize, it's like, oh, they were peaceful. No, actually, the Buddha's this whole tradition grew out from a very violent time as well. 
And the same goes with Thay's uh, life and his tradition. Uh, our tradition grew, grows up from uh, a, its seed, its origin is from a violent war between ideologies, between they call communism and what's the other one? Uh, what are we? Cap. Uh, uh, what are they? Called? Demo- democracy. Yeah. Democracy is the new religion. Oh, it's kind of democratic, capitalist, the new religion. I have to be careful how I'm making that into a dogma to fight against. And so my parent, my f- grandfather escaped China during the Cultural Revolution. So he left China to go to Vietnam because of ideology. And then my parents escaped Vietnam to come to America because of ideology. Right? And then manifest as a violent war. And then now in America, I escape and I go to France and I become a Buddhist, a real communist. <laughs> oh, that could get me in trouble. Mm. And so, what I want to share is that what does this have to do with anything happening in the world? And what does this have to do with the winter retreat? Yesterday uh, at lunch, uh, many of our young uh, friends that came, they all stood up to share why they come here. Many of them come here for three months. And it's, I love hearing people's reasons for coming. It's, uh, it's just like, it just fills me up with a lot of the vitamins, you know, mm-hmm. to hear people wanting to change uh, their habit. And this is uh, the range retreat for us to relook at our lives, to relook at our uh, habits. I think uh, the common myth or the story narrative out there that it takes uh, 21 days to change a habit. You ever hear that? Yeah? That's three weeks, right? Uh, we're going to add it up. It's not three weeks, it's three months. <laughs> but actually, uh, it's not very, uh, um, uh, how do you call it, absolute. It's so like you can change your habit, but then because it's so easy to change, it's very easy also to go back. So change is both ways. Progress and regress is the same amount of energy. But actually, a bad habit is much easier to acquire. You ever work with children, you'll know that. Oh my God, as soon as you do something off the, uh, the rules, they all know it. And they go like, but you did it. You know, oh my God, they are so, you work with children, they are very good. Especially when it's something wrong or something like not right. So mm, my counterbalance to that is like, I do sneaky things all the time, so... They, uh, they can't catch. <laughs> so three months, three weeks. So these are things uh, for us to I invite everyone to look and know that Blue Cliff also, Blue Cliff Monastery will start their rains retreat. This very same, in fact, they already started three, three hours ago. And they also will do the three months as well as Magnolia Grove Monastery in a few weeks. So be aware that there are uh, three centers practicing people there to renew and to re-examine our place, to prepare ourselves. And remember the intention, both in the time of the Buddha and during Thai's time, during wartime. So when we come back and take care of ourselves, we are taking care of the world. The world needs one less disgruntled, one less depressed, one less, you know, kind of angry person. And we need more, one more person who can actually touch peace, who can handle their feelings, who is not reactive, who are open to different views, open to different ways of living. 
So just one person will make the difference. And so when we come together, the three months, is uh, we're not practicing just for ourselves. But we're practicing exactly for these places that need it. Because you see the origin of every individual, every group of people, every nation to support violence. It takes a lot of individuals who actually think like that, that they are the problem. And violence and military machines will help relieve the problem. Can you believe that that actually is... And the government, we put the government there, both here and all the places that cause war, America and many other nations as well. So you see Thai's uh, endeavor to call for peace, it never ended. You think the war in Vietnam ended in 1975? No, it does not end. It continues, and it has different names. Different names, right? From uh, what, uh, communists, VC, gooks, terrorists, uh, you know, name, many new names that we have now. Many new labels that we, uh, we uh, choose to separate because we're too, uh, it's too hard to actually look at why they would feel like that. And it's just too easy just to jump to say, oh, and to blame. And that's what I'm dealing with now and uh, preparing myself and will continue to prepare myself for the next year. So the three months, we come back and it's an inventory. So those of you who do not attend uh, here physically, uh, watching online every sun Sunday or whatever, whenever you do have time in your week, we invite you to also join the spirit of the three months, which is to return and do inventory. Like, what do I have? What am I carrying that blocks me from thriving, from opening up and being happy? What is it that blocks me that I hold on to so tightly? Which person do I, you know, cut from my heart that I choose not to even hold them in my heart? let alone write a letter or an email. So these things uh, prevent us from having uh, touching true ease and peace. You see, the root of war is not uh, is when a country declares war, but we have war inside. We also have these things, uh, what, what you know, a nation does to another nation is kind of like an inverse to war. It's like, we'll ignore you. We will cut out all your economic... Uh, it's like, they call it sanction? You know? It's like another violence. Embargo, yeah. You know, it's like the inverse of bombing. It's like, now we won't bomb you, but we're going to remove and uh, make you dry up as a culture, as a nation. So these are uh, ways that we do internally as an individual. How many of you have sanctions towards someone? Okay, there you go. How many of you have like total ultimatums, you know? It, nothing will change unless you do this. You know, ultimatums, you know? <laughs> I used to have a lot of those. And Thai and the practice helped me see this. And this is the beginning of, um, of being helpful if you want to be, or at least be a nice person in the world. Is that slowly we remove the different, uh, in uh, the spiritual um, language, we call it internal knots. In 
internal knots, uh, noi get. So inter noi is like internal. Get is like something that tightens up. I had many of those. Some so big that I had no no way, no no idea where to unravel it. <laughs> you know the one that drove me uh, to driving crazy and going berserk because I had knots that are so tight that I just don't know what to do with it. And you see how that could be the root of a lot of things violent. Mm. So when we come back to the range retreat, first is to train ourselves to uh, be at ease with our body, with our mind. And we do sitting meditation. We also do touching the earth. We'll have uh, classes for us to learn more at different ways of looking at things. So this for us is a, a time for us to slow down, to stop. And then to relook, like inventory, right? And the five things we look at is our five, uh, we call it uh, aggregates. First, our body, our feelings, our perception, how we look at things, what triggers us, how we look at ourselves in the mirror or when we take pictures, how we look at ourselves as a kind of built idea of who we need to be, how we should look like. These are all, you think you're free, but you are built up from generations of perceptions put on to you, projections, that you need to be this type of mother, this type of father, this type of child, this type of worker, and so on. This idea of uh, many things that we have, our perception. And then we look at our mental formation, which is a little bit more uh, uh, perceptions like happen like constantly through our senses like when you go up to eat food mm, smells great and then it triggers that's perception right mental formation more notions and ideas about happiness what is the purpose of all this ideas about our family ideas about the pressure our parents have on us so we hold on to these and then also look at our, 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 our collective mind, our consciousness, our culture, our upbringing, our back, you know, our baggage, cultural baggage. You think this is uh, normal? You go to uh, Uganda in Africa, you go to Liberia, you stay there a few weeks, a few months, and you see, like, wow. You begin to see, like, wow. The American culture is very particular. <laughs> Avocados on toast. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know where that came from. <laughs> um, but there's things that people are like, what are you eating, you know? And so these are mm, things that we examine, the habits that we have. And this has a lot to do with our happiness and suffering, as well as our work for justice, for environmental uh, mm, injustice to the animal kingdom, to the plant and the mineral kingdom, what's happening to our ecosystem, as well as what's happening to our, our society as a people, as a human family, why people are losing, uh, I hear there's a lot of uh, uh, despair in the young people. A lot of, we did some research before the teen camp and there's a, a national uh, worry because they don't have an answer why a lot of young people are committing suicide and it's increasing. In fact, uh, the U.S. government and I think the government in the U.K. as well, in Europe. So these are also despair, depression, and it's very linked to how we've set up our society and uh, we're lacking in a spiritual dimension. And in spiritual dimension is not this whooshy kind of worship stuff. 
but it's exactly what I share is the, you know, actually giving time to actually slow down and look at ourselves and look at our feelings and how we look at things and we question and ask why. Why do we do what we do? You know, growing up, growing up in America, I, uh, I felt guilty sometimes to actually uh, take a break. You know? you know, I got trained in the office, in school, to actually uh, in reflection that, uh, that our culture is so uh, productive. You know, I wanted, it was like, I was proud to be productive. I was trained as an architect. That caused me so much, uh, as it, uh, as like, you know, when something is, uh, what do you call it, when you flex? Yeah, flex. You know, we're like a flex culture. Our culture is like always in flex. Y- you know what I mean? Like, you you, know, you can feel this in the elevator. I use the elevator as a social uh, examination. People stand in there and they're like, you know, and I'm like, you know, I was like, move, soft, soft enough. <laughs> you know, sorry, I'm very uh, cynical. <laughs> but our culture, I grew up like that. And you can see how this young person almost went berserk. Because our culture, we are uh, so, uh, uh, mm, we raise a pedestal about being productive so much that we don't know why we're doing it, but we keep going. That is where we're at. And when we are unhappy and we're empty inside, is exactly that same energy that will blame other people for our own unhappiness, our own whatever, insecurity. So we think safety comes from building more this and that and destroying more. You see Tai's vision for calling peace and why he continued to have retreats and to build sangha and retreat centers is so that we can actually touch the spiritual dimension. And the method that we uh, use is very simple. It's nothing mm, grand or like you have to pay thousands of dollars to, to, to go through a program. It's very simple, the breath. Okay? Breathing in and breathing out. Can you believe that? It's like, you don't need to pay more to train like that. And what is that secret? And all of you can do it right now, okay? As you breathe in, you just relax. Right away, as you bring that intention, I'm going to pay attention to my breath, you're really present. And when you have presence, you begin to see clearly. You have an opportunity to train yourself to see more clearly. So in Buddhism, they call that uh, mindfulness, being mindful of our breath. All of a sudden, we're mindful of the present moment. The formula is so simple that people are trying to make it complicated so they can get your money, okay? There's so many mindfulness programs and mindfulness teachers, and I looked it up, thousands of dollars for a program. Don't get fooled. But, I mean, if it helps you, go for it. But breathing in and being aware of our breath, all the tools and gadgets that we need is right in our body. Right? Anytime you have a strong emotion, anytime you feel sad, remember, You have the gadget. It's not on your app. Just close your eyes. Drop your shoulder. Turn the arrow inward. And two questions. How's my body? How's my feeling? That is what we're going to do for three months. 
And if you put your mind to it 100%, one winter retreat, Thay passed out a card for all the monks and nuns and all the lay friends. They say 100%. Can you believe that? Thay passed out. Every one of us got a card 100%. So I invite all of us this uh, brains retreat to put a hundred percent to turn our arrow inward. Here doesn't mean you, you're reclusive and you don't want to like look at anybody, but here is when you're washing dishes, eating, walking, working, interacting, silent or talking. Your arrow is watching. You're aware. This is spiritual practice, spiritual dimension. Okay? And you train to have that gauge, to not lose yourself in whatever activity that you're doing. You can also lose yourself in meditation. So the main thing is to check, am I present? with our breath, with our body. And you do it regularly, okay? So the rains retreat, you have three months to create that, a routine. You wake up early, you go to sitting, you create new, you've never done this before, not this long either. So this uh, triggers uh, novelty, triggers uh, a kind of re- uh, orienting your neural pathways, as in the neuroscience, it, yeah, it's quite studied. Uh, when you create a new habit, these other habits has an opportunity to tag along. And it's a beautiful uh, way, and that's where insight comes from. Okay, so you do this regularly, and the sense of calm, you have clarity. So this uh, reduce our simulation with the outside world. That's why we have boundaries. We have restraint. So that we can actually be less stimulated with the news of things so that our mind now begins to look at our knots, the things that we hold on to. And then with the training, it uh, loosens up. And you find out, is it God? Just my idea <laughs> about myself, my mental formation. Or it's actually how I was uh, raised, how my parents fed me that notion, my culture, my Vietnamese, Chinese side. Be proud man of the house. Eh? So these ideas they cause a lot of suffering to yourself and to other people. And so when you have those insight, it's the, it's the fruit of the practice. And uh, it is the most valuable thing in the, that you can touch as a human being. Many of you have insights already. And when you have a real insight and it releases you, it's a kind of, uh, that's a kind of different from knowledge. Knowledge, you become informative, you know many things. Oh yeah, that's a agave plant, that's an oak tree. Oh, that's what's happening in the world. Informative, right? But like you're still very uh, mm. reactive and judgmental and so on. Insight liberates you. And it frees you and it makes you lighter, more tolerant, more open. Is, a very, is very different from uh, uh, things that we learn in school that make us very smart. You know smart people? You can tell they don't have insight because it, it's quite annoying. I had, I had friends that came back from very prestigious school and we used to have arguments over a basketball game because you come very tight. In you know, knowledge, you become like this. You accumulate knowledge, right? Insight, you release. That's the difference. They use a match to uh, 
distinguish between insight. When you light a match, and it helps you see things, and it burns to the end, and no longer the match is there, but you have seen it already. So you don't need the match. That is a kind of liberation. So you don't get caught and you go looking for more matches. But you've already seen it. That is the, uh, you see why you behave like that. And you're like, man. And you see how it changes the way you move around. So release is an important thing to remember. To distinguish when you have insight and you have more ideas about things and ask yourself, am I holding on to them? Therefore, that's not insight. So we have ideas about our brothers, our sisters, about our practice, about where our tradition is going. Mm, This winter retreat. Fear you will. <laughs> it is uh, it's quite, um, I know I've been doing this for a while, and uh, I say I, I still have a lot more to uh, uh, work on. But I just share with you uh, that up to this very point, I think, is the most worthy thing to do as a human being. I can almost uh, uh, personally for me um, and you got other stuff to do Mm, but I see the most valuable thing that we can contribute to the world is our own uh, lightening up and this is what we can offer to what is happening in the world and each one of us will be on our own uh, whatever scope and effect that we can have on the state of the world, it will help us even expand that effect. So this is something very important in our work as um, advocates and activists and social uh, change makers, teachers and lawyers, whatever, even advertising, and media, right? How you can actually write a story differently. But the base is in your growth and development as an individual human being who can touch real happiness, real liberation. And this will be more uh, sustaining. And I'll just mention here, community is quite important as well. Our teacher's uh, last development in his call for peace that actually to maintain it, to sustain it, you need a community, a sangha, a group of friends who actually have the same vibe, the same affinity as you. They do not all have to agree, but you learn how to live in harmony in your differences. The world is not going to be in harmony as you think it is, agreeing at everything. But to... Truths can exist, and they seem like they're different. And this is the struggle for us to resist, to have to choose a side. And this you can see in the world, in our politics, in the nations, the disputes, the destruction. The basis is because we cannot reconcile that there can be two entities, two Groups of people with different views living together. And in the monastery, we are proof that it can happen. You know, recently I ate loka and white rice. It's like a very Vietnamese dish with white rice next to Italian rosito. Rosito? It's like a a weird, right? Rosetto? Rosotto. Yeah. And then then we had, it was another, uh, oh, Southwest beans. All on the same table. Did you eat that? Was that yesterday? I was like, where can you get like, 
amazing, three different cultures on the same plate. And I made sure I got, uh, it was my prayer. I know food is so much easier than cultures and ideas. But please uh, uh, practice so we can uh, have space to hold contradictions, things that seem different, ideas, peoples that seem different, but that there's enough space in our heart to hold that, that it's okay. People have different views about things. Our brothers and sisters as well. As we practice, if we're not careful, we also form many, many uh, sanctions and embargoes. And we cut, don't give any chance for them to breathe. And this is our challenge right in this moment as we move forward into the new year. And I've been uh, cautioning people, prepare this three months is prepare for election year. So is it? Uh, all of you already took a deep breath. Uh, <laughs> so remember, okay? You're preparing yourself so you will not be missled by the missiles of media and wrong perception and having you choose a side, choose a color, resist. It's very tough, huh? Because you know the other side is wrong and evil, and they're out to get more rich, and da 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 and then you tighten up, right? right. Well, good luck. And know that we are doing the same. 